Well, good morning, Green Valley. Who's happy to be in church today? Yeah. 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 Tim's happy to be in church today, aren't you? Man? Oh, you right bet. On. Yeah. Hey, um, so some of you don't know, this is uh, Tim Fulton, and uh, Tim is uh, here with me today, and we're going to be working on this message today. And um, we're continuing our series on Inside Out. Now, if you're new, what we've been doing is we've been taking a look at the positive side of what many times is negative emotions. In other words, we've been looking at these emotions that could either tip us one way or the other. We can lean into them and help us grow in our lives and challenge our lives, or we can allow those emotions to paralyze our life. And so if we started out the first week with fear and how fear, reverent fear of God can actually move us forward in our relationship with God and actually grow us in our relationship and our, our convictions. Um, last week, uh, John did an amazing job with pain. Pain's a tough emotion because it's got a lot of stuff that goes with it. But if we lean into it from the positive side, there's things that God can show us and we can experience that we would never experience without pain. It's not something we wish on anybody, but it's something that can we actually help us grow. So I encourage you to go back if you haven't listened to that message. But today we're talking about the message of doubt. Because here's the thing, or the emotion of doubt, I should say. The, the emotion of doubt is this. The power of our emotions actually has great potential to our lives. It bring, brings great potential in the way that we use them. And the emotion of doubt can actually be used in a way to help us grow our lives and challenge our lives. Now, before we jump into that, um, today is also a special day because uh, today, um, Tim, after being, let me see, you were, you were born in this church, in this no, auditorium? No, not quite. Not okay, quite, all right, no. all right. <laughs> Came here when we were 10. 10 when I was years 10. old, all yeah, right. Yeah. So Tim's been, go, uh, Tim's been going to this church for 40 plus years. He's been on staff for 30 plus years, and he is retiring as of today. It's an interesting thing right there, huh? Because you don't know what to do because you're sad Tim's leaving, so you want to go, ah, but you're also happy for him at the same time. So Tim, um, we're excited for you, and um, I, I'm, I, before we get into the message, I want to go down memory lane a little bit. Is that Okay. Sure. Let's show some pictures from the past. I don't have a choice. No, you don't have a choice. So, let's show some pictures of the past right here. This is Tim. Um, this is when he had a mullet, and uh, you never did have a mullet. No did? mullet. No, no that's... mullet, but he had some long hair, man. He was uh, one sexy dude for a while, man. <laughs> And uh, this is him at the Hope House tournament, and we would raise money for our Hope House. This next one here is when we were really young, John and Tim right there. Mm -hmm. This is when they were 22 years old yeah. right there, man, yeah. a long time ago. This is me and Tim at lunch, and uh, yeah, and I had hair back then, so it was amazing. <laughs> and then this next one here is um, uh, some of the ministries that we do together. Tim has been involved with baptizing people. We'd go down to the river um, every August uh, years ago, and we go baptize people there. Also, Tim has also been a part of a uh, Mexico trip. <laughs> and this is after he hasn't showered in a week, and so his <laughs> hair's gotten out of control. Uh, this next one here is um, Night at the North Pole. Tim was Frosty the Snowman. Everybody thought he was Olaf, but uh, it was Frosty the Snowman for us. And then this one needs some explanation. <laughs> I threw this in there because we need some explanation because it actually looks ridiculous, but actually this has some depth behind us. So tell us what that is, please. I have no Redeem idea. Redeem this picture. <laughs> I have no idea what's going on there. Yes, you do have no. an idea. No, I don't. Okay, let me help Tim's memory because he's old now. Uh, you are walking a mile in her shoes. Oh, that's right. <laughs> it's painful. That's why I forgot it. Yeah. God bless all you ladies. Yeah, that was for... Um, that was for uh, the uh, Center for Violence-Free Relationships. Yep. Yeah, and just uh, for, for anybody that's uh, gone through uh, home violence, it was a march against that. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So, so they, they put high heels on us. Right on. Yeah. We had to put that picture in there. I just had to. I'm yeah, sorry, bro. Okay. Yeah. All, All right. right. <laughs> and then, of course, Tim's been a teacher here, and, and this is his last day officially teaching with us, but not the last day of teaching here at Green Valley, because Tim is going to stay at Green Valley in his retirement, and he's going to be serving here and hanging out with us. So. Yeah, it's not really retirement. It's a promotion. It's a promotion. Because I, I get to be a volunteer now. Now, tell me about that. Well, um, yeah, vo volunteering is, is way better than, than being a professional whatever. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. And hopefully I can just live up to, you know, the, 
amazing volunteers that we already have here at Green Valley. Yeah, we do have a lot yeah, of amazing volunteers yeah. at Green Valley. And, and, and every ministry's asked me to volunteer except worship, so. <laughs> and that's a good thing. Because no, we're not I, called I, to everything. No, no. And that not. would be a way to empty your auditorium in three notes or less. <laughs> 30, 30 years down the drain. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Tim, let's jump into the subject today. Hey, um, so this emotion of doubt we're going to be talking about, and here's two universal truths. The first one is this, all of us have doubts, but the second universal truth is this, that all of us live by faith. Now let me dive into that first one real quick, all of us have doubts. Um, you know what doubt is, it's a feeling of uncertainty, and it, it's in all areas of our lives, we can't deny it. As a matter of fact, let me give you just an everyday example. So when I was going to ask Kelly to marry me, uh, I knew that I wanted to marry her intellectually. She's a great gal, checks off all the boxes. Emotionally, my emotions said I wanted to marry her. Um, she told me that I was marrying up. And uh, so <laughs> she actually told me that all women uh, tell men that they're married up, and that's true. Yep. But there was always a little bit of doubt behind that as well. It's like, okay, how's this going to work out? Is it going to be fun? Is it going to be hard times? Are we going to make it? Is it going to fin- you know, are we going to finish the race together? There was always those doubts that go with it, but we made a commitment to one another. So we had this conflict with, yes, I, I, I do want to do this, but I also had doubts. But see, the other side of the coin of, as we all have doubts, we all live by faith as well. We all step into things that we have doubts about, but we still do them anyway. How many of you have ever flown an airplane? Raise your hand. Flown an airplane? Okay, now let's just think about this for just a minute. You have 150 plus people all inside a cylinder-shaped aluminum alloy coffin. <laughs> Every time I get into a plane, I think to myself, is this going to be the day that it doesn't make it? But I get into that thing anyway, as an idiot would, and just get in there until I can get to the other side. So we all live by faith. So we all have doubts, and we all live by faith. So here's the thing that we're going to discuss today. If you wait to have no doubts in life, if you wait to have all your answers, uh, you know, all the answers to your questions, you'll never do anything. You'll never step into anything, you'll never grow, you'll never be challenged, you'll never experience life, I believe, the way that God intended it, because there's a lot of faith that goes with life. And so if you wait for all your doubts to be answered, then um, you're never going to do anything. So today what we want to look at is we want to look at what the positive side of doubt is and how that drives us to a deeper faith. So, Tim, we have a couple stories we want to talk about there. What's your favorite story about doubt in the Bible? Oh, it has to be about Thomas. He's one of the original 12 disciples. I mean, Jesus prayed all night on who to pick, and Thomas was one of them. We call him Doubting Thomas. Literally, that, that's his moniker. He's Doubting Thomas. And, uh, you know, we have John the Beloved. That's really cool, but he's Doubting Thomas. <laughs> and uh, he has lots of questions, but because he has lots of questions, he gets lots of answers. But the, the, the place where his doubt failed him the most was after the resurrection of Jesus. And uh, Jesus had gone to the cross. He died for the sins of the world so that we could be saved. And then he rose again on the third day. And uh, Thomas didn't see Jesus when the other disciples saw Jesus after the resurrection. In fact, he told them, I will not believe unless I see him. And I put my finger in the nail holes and I put my hand in his side. Um, I mean, that, that's, how, that's how deep his doubt went. So he was, uh, he was with the disciples uh, one, one day, and, and Jesus appeared. And literally, Jesus just challenges him. He says, he says, Thomas, put your finger in the holes and your hand in my side. And, uh, and Thomas immediately at that moment falls on his knees. And he says, my Lord and my God, it is the first time this exclamation of who Jesus is is in the Bible, my Lord and my God. Um, and, and Jesus helps him a little bit. He says, you know, Thomas, it's great that you believe. Bless are those who believe who've never seen. Right. And, uh, but yeah, I mean, yeah, he's, he's, he's one of my favorite disciples just because he had doubts, he had questions, but he persevered and he got answers. Yeah. Yeah. 
I, I love that story. I, I also have, love a story in the Bible about a guy who wanted his son healed. His son was demon-possessed and was doing all kinds of self-harm. And so he tried everything. And so when he comes to Jesus, he's in a desperate mode. And so he says to Jesus, he says, have mercy on us and help us if you can. And so Jesus responds to him like this. He says, what do you mean if I can, Jesus asked. He says, anything is possible if a person believes. So the father instantly cried out, I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. And I think that's, I love that because that's the human condition right there in one sentence. I want to believe this is true because I, I have some, I have a need here, but I also have this unbelief and I need you to help me with that. So how does Jesus respond? Well, he rebukes the evil spirit, the Bible says, and he says, listen, you spirit that makes this boy unable to hear and speak. He said, I command you to come out of this child and never enter him again. And the boy was healed in that moment. Now, here's the two things I love about this story. The first of all was the man's authenticity with Jesus. I mean, here he is coming to what he thinks is his last resort. And Jesus, by this time, is a well-respected rabbi. And yet in that moment when he's asked, what do you mean if I can, he feels safe enough with Jesus to go, hey, I do believe a lot about you, but I still have some unbeliefs about you. That to me is an amazing moment to get a picture of God and mankind's relationship. That God is willing to go, okay, I get it. I, it's okay. And at this moment, the second thing we see is we get to see not just man's authenticity and safety to be honest with God, but we also get to see God's compassion and love for mankind. Because even though the man had an unbelief, what does Jesus do? He doesn't say to the guy, hey, you know what? Um, sorry, you don't have enough faith, so you're going to have to go struggle with your son for the rest of your life. Be on your way. No, he heals his son. It just shows Jesus' compassion for him. And this is what I love about this subject of doubt, is that yeah. doubt many times we think of it as so much of a negative thing, especially when it comes to our faith in God. But the truth is, if we lean into our doubts, we actually will have a deeper understanding of God, just like Thomas and this man that we have who had a son that needed to be healed. So today, what I want to talk about is this, is we just want to talk about the three things that will help us use doubt for a positive way to give us a deeper relationship with Christ. So Tim, start us off. What, what's the first thing that we need to understand? Well, that, that I'm damaged and uh, uh, I have issues, which is not a surprise to my wife. Um, <laughs> uh, the, the knowledge of evil uh, that, that happened when Adam and Eve ate of the tree, the knowledge of good and evil, that um, the knowledge of good was great. It was the evil side that, that sent us down a path of, of beginning to question God's word, beginning to question who God is. And, you know, Satan said, did God say? And so there's that, that seed of doubt. But, you know, um, both of, uh, you know, when you talk about this, this man whose son was uh, harmed by this evil spirit and, and Thomas, one of them had doubt about his own faith, and Thomas had doubts about Jesus. And, and this really does speak to this damage that we have in us because we have enough experience to know from our own failures and from people's other uh, failures and evil that's been done to us that we've got a lot of doubts about us as, as human beings. That's and right. So, so yeah. Um, I, I've had doubts before. Okay. Yeah. And uh, th this is one that happened to me. I'd been in ministry. Uh, for a while, this is back in the 80s, and, uh, I, and um, I'd left one ministry and was thinking about going to another ministry, so I, I took a job as a youth pastor in a town down by Bakersfield, it was right by hell, and um, <laughs> <coughs> um, so I, I moved my, my little family down there, all three girls could fit in the wagon, that's, that's how young the, well, my family was, I moved them down there, when I got down there, um, they didn't pay us. And so, uh, I, I, you know, I, I took a secular job to try to be a youth pastor down there as best I could. But yeah, it, it became a real damaging spot in my life. And I, I, I got my family back up here uh, to the Plasterville area. And um, 
we had gone to the pound and we'd gotten this big yellow dog. And uh, her name was Lady. She had some, very original name, by the yeah, way. Yeah, thought, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Lady. yeah. <laughs> she, she had a lot of boxer in her and a lot of other stuff, too. She was just a big yellow dog. And, uh, and I, was, I was really down, you know, because of this disappointment and, and doubt that it entered my mind. And one of the things I'd done, I'd thrown away all my uh, resources, my ministerial resources, all my books. I just threw them away. Just thought, you know what? I think I'm done. So I, I was sitting on, on the little driveway there and uh, having a big pity party, which is part of my life. <laughs> and, uh, um, and I'm sitting there having a pity party. And, uh, and I told God, I said, I don't think you're a very good God. I, I doubt your goodness. And a uh, lady came over and sat down beside me, and you know, because she was smarter than me. And um, um, I'm sitting there having my pity party, and this word kind of came to me. It was like, well, I'm, you're not a very good follower. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> okay where's that from? You know? And, and you're unthankful. And I'm like, well, what do I got to be thankful for? And the, the, the strangest thing happened. I looked over at my dog, and I'm like, well, I'm thankful I have a good dog because my brother-in-law, Randy, at that time had a really stupid dog. And the lady was a good dog. And, and she was there comforting me and, you know, doing the doggy thing. And, uh, and uh, all of a sudden, a floodgate opened of thankfulness. And, uh, and my doubts began to go away. I, I began to thank God because I do have an amazing wife. I've got three great kids. It's so much fun. And... Uh, and I was back up here in Placerville living off of Pleasant Valley Road. Come on. Yeah. yeah. Okay, come on, baby. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, I'm glad that that happened to you because yeah. you're sitting here today. Because yeah. You didn't but that's from damage. Direction. That's yeah. from damage. Yeah. Uh, my own damage and, and the damage caused to me. Yeah. 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 You know, um, this happened in the first service because what he talked about there is, is he touched on something that some of you have probably dealt with or maybe dealing with right now. It's, and that's called church baggage or church hurt where you've had a spiritual leader or a church or a small group or somebody that's failed you spiritually. And so what happens is, is when the people who represent Christ are supposed to represent Christ, um, when they fail you, then that creates doubts about God because of their failure. Now, I, I have a similar testimony on that. So, and I know some of you are new, so I'll quickly go over it. I grew up in church. My dad's a pastor. My dad's Great dude, he was next to Jesus in my opinion. I got a great example. But there was a group of people that just harassed him in the church and it was really ridiculous stuff like he didn't have a crease in his pants one Sunday or his hair is not cut right. I mean, just stupid stuff. And so my dad had a nervous breakdown in front of me as a teenager and so I grew up in my teenage years to have a real healthy hatred for church and churchy people. And so that kind of stuck with me and I, I, I told God I'll never be a pastor and I'll never go to church again. Those are the two things that... That he told me, that I told him. But what happened was, God started to work on my heart. And to make the long story really short, what I had to get over is I had to get over allowing imperfect people keep me from a perfect God. Amen. And that's a lot of times what happens in our lives is that our doubts, maybe our legitimate doubts, okay, so let's say there's legitimate doubts, are given strength or energy by other people's imperfections. And so we have to bypass other people's imperfections because we're all imperfect and we got to go straight to God and wrestle with God on yeah. our own to yep. get there. Yeah. So I encourage you, we, we're all broken. And so remember that when you're damaged, remember that other people who represent Christ are damaged as well. Yeah. So if you have doubts about him, you know, go straight to God, get past that. As a matter of fact, in, uh, there's a verse in Jude that I love very much. It says, be merciful to those, those who, who doubt. doubt. Yeah. Why? Because we all do. We all do. Yeah. So there's a second step in this, though, Tim. It says, I'm, I'm damaged, but what's next? Oh, here's, here's the good news. We're redeemable. Amen. Yeah, yeah, all of us, yeah. each and every one of us, even people in Bakersfield. Uh, <laughs> God has a plan for everyone. <laughs> and uh, those of you online that have family in Bakersfield, or maybe you're watching from Bakersfield, I apologize for Tim. No. He's retiring today. No. So no. please continue to no. watch us, okay? No, no they understand. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they understand. They understand. Yeah, yeah. They, they, know. they know. Yeah, we're all redeemable. Yeah, and, and, you know, that's, 
This amazing uh, verse, uh, John 3, 17. God didn't send his son into the world to condemn it, but that the world through him might be saved. And this, this is the heart of God to redeem each and every one of us. And um, God does in amazing, amazing ways. Each and every one of us here is a, is a redemption miracle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, That's true. Yeah. You know, one of the things you, you talk about, Tim, is you've always, and it's in your story mm -hmm. of life, is there's this, um, there's this perseverance to continue to fight through doubts in yeah. order to seek God in deeper ways. Yeah. Well, this is a promise from the Bible. It says in Matthew 7, it says, keep asking and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking, you will find. Keep on knocking, the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks, receives. Everyone who seeks, finds. And to everyone who knocks, the door will be open. There's, there's this perseverance about going after God. Yeah, and, and, and that perseverance is a result of that invitation from Jesus to ask, seek, and knock. And uh, this, is a, this is a story when, when uh, Gail and I were ministers at the Pyramid Lake Reservation in, in Nevada. And uh, there was a fellow uh, named George there, and he came to church every once in a while. And, and uh, one day he came and knocked on our door, and, and I opened the door, and, and he was just shaking. I mean, just shaking, and, and he, was, he was a powerful man. And uh, I go, man, George, what is going on? And uh, he, he came in, and he goes, I had my gun in my mouth, and my little granddaughter taught her, taught, you know, just two years old, just tottered in, and he said, I couldn't pull the trigger, so I came here. I said, well, George, how did you get to this place? What, what, you know, what really is happening here? And he told me this story. Uh, he'd, he'd been a second lieutenant in Vietnam, and uh, uh, he was in charge of a little over 20 guys, and he had two guys in his unit that were just barely 18. They were just boys, just boys. And one, one of the things as a Native American, uh, one of George cultural implants deeply into his soul and heart is that everybody gets up the trail. So he was completely dedicated to making sure all his men got home, and especially these two boys. And um, both of them died in his arms while he was calling on God to save them. And that, that ended his conversations with God until this moment when he, when he came just looking for help, that desperation, mm -hmm. the desperation of Thomas, the desperation of this man whose son was, had an evil spirit. Um, and, and I said, well, well, George, have you shared this story with anyone ever? And he goes, no, this is the first time. Hmm. He'd kept all this stuff in with himself. And I said, well, have you ever talked to God about that? He goes, no, no, that, that was it. And so, you know, I, I'm, I'm like, this is one of those times in ministry where you're going, I have nothing for you, George, <laughs> just except to listen. Um, I said, George, I said, you know, you did your best, and life and death is in the hands of God. I said, why don't you go take a walk out in the desert and talk to God about this? You know, thanks for sharing with me, but I think you need to talk to God about it. And so uh, George did. And uh, after a while, uh, he came back, and, and there, was, there was great peace. It was actually a couple of days later. And um, I said, well, George, um, what would you do? He goes, well, um, I talked things out with God, and uh, I threw my gun in the river, and uh, we're, we're going to move on from here. Praise God. And, um, and it just, once again, it speaks to that perseverance. Right. You know, if he'd, ever, if he'd never come to that point, that desperation point where he said, I've got to have an answer. My answer is not good enough. He'd have never got the answer he needed from God. That's right. Yeah. You know, even as, even as Christ followers, we still have doubts about certain things. So, for instance, you know, I was thinking about this. Um, there's some things that I have um, solid, I've solidified. I don't have any doubts about. I know God loves me. I know that for a fact. I know he shaped me the way I'm shaped on purpose. Um, I know that God transforms people. He takes them out of pits and he brings them into his transforming power and makes something beautiful out of them no matter where they've been. I also am convinced that, you know, I, I don't doubt his teachings on how to do life. The Bible is the, the map, the direction on how to do life. I don't doubt that at all. But there's certain things you struggle with because of your experiences. So for me, it's healing. I had two parents who die of cancer, both Christ followers. You know, I've had a brother-in-law who's in the hospital right now with a Gillian Barre disease who we're asking for God to heal him on that. And you know, there's, this, there's these things that we still struggle for, but what happens is this, is even in those doubts and these honest conversations with God, 
Something happens when you seek God supernaturally that actually solidifies your faith. Because for me, even though I have these doubts about this particular issue, there's nothing else. There's nowhere else to turn. So what I do is I have to surrender to the ultimate will of God. And that's not always easy. But it, it actually, when we seek after God, even in our doubts as Christ followers, it actually helps to solidify our faith. Yeah, a- absolutely. And, uh, you know, w- w- some of our doubt comes from ex- experience in a, in a very positive way. And w- one of the doubts I, I have that I've learned over time is I doubt God will ever answer yes to any of my selfish prayers. <laughs> yeah. 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 And... I've thrown fits in prayer time. I, I call it prayer, but it's just a fit. <laughs> it's just, you know, it's, it's Tim at two years old just coming out, you know, that's, that's damage. Yeah. Um, but yeah, um, you know, as, you, as life happens, doubts just fly in, you know, whether it's, it's the enemy or life or from other people, whatever. And every, every once in a while, I'll be thinking about the story of God and salvation and, you know, from Genesis 3.15, the first promise that God's going to, you know, end evil and the whole story of Jesus and the promise of a Messiah and him going to the cross and resurrection. You're like going, is this all true? Mm-hmm. Is this all true? Yeah. And it's, it's moments like that. A couple things happens. One, there's a, there's a few chapters in the Bible that are so amazing to me that if God isn't true, these chapters couldn't be written at all. One is Psalm 22 and the other is Isaiah 55. They're descriptions of Jesus going to the cross thousand years, hundreds of years before Jesus ever did. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing is, since we've been in ministry, we see Jesus redeem people. I mean, it's, you're like going, okay, without Jesus, there's no hope, you know, and, 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 and God saved that person. I guess there's hope for me. So yeah, (laughs) yeah, yeah. So yeah. I mean, actually, we say that about John. John a lot. If John's yeah, saved, yeah, if John's yeah. saveable, then we're saveable. Yeah, <laughs> that's, you guys don't know the miracle. I, it's a, it's just, but we won't say anything. That's, that's, that's for him to share. Right. <laughs> so, to me, we got, I'm, I'm damaged, I'm redeemable, but there's the one more, and this is the key. That's grace. There's no hope for us if, if not for grace, and grace is the gift of forgiveness. And what's really cool about the word forgiveness, that giving of God is, it's for, it's before, it's here, it's available now. It's, it's here for us when we do have doubt. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's one of the things when, when you press in, when you ask, you seek, you knock, um, God shows up. This is his promise to each and every one of us. If you seek me, you will find me if you seek me with all your heart. That's a direct promise from God. And he answers it over and over and over for anybody who just presses in like that. And, and the grace that we see is in the lives that he interacted with in scripture mm-hmm. with Thomas. I mean, here, yeah. here's somebody that he could have been graceless to. Oh, yeah. Because Thomas had been with him for three years. He actually told him that he was going to die and he was going to rise again in three days. And Thomas said, I don't believe, I don't believe, I don't believe. (laughs) He could have just been all hardcore with Thomas, but he treats him with grace. Treats him with grace. This this guy who tells him, you know, hey, I I, I got some unbelief. He he treats him with grace. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. There's a, there's a quote from, I think it's Thomas Paine and I could be wrong on this. Um, Somebody way smarter than me said this, there is more faith in honest doubt than all the creeds in the world put together. And, and wow. that's, that's what God, I think, really honors is the honesty in someone to say, yeah, I've, I've got some problems, God. Yeah. yeah, and God's not afraid of that. Yeah. So there's a story, Timmy, that uh, represents the pursuit of God, the brokenness, but pursuing the answers, doubt, using doubt as a, you know, uh, something positive that actually turned his life around. Share that story. Yeah, this is, this is Lee Strobel's story. And... Uh, he, was, uh, he had a Bachelor of Journalism and uh, a Master's deg- degree uh, from Yale Law School. He was a really smart guy. And he became a uh, reporter, a journalist, yeah. but, but, but an investigative reporter because he had this mind that could just really get into stories and tear them apart and put them back together. And, um, and it, Something happened to him. He was 14 years at the Chicago Tribune, and something happened in his life 
that really messed him up because he was an atheist. And what happened was his wife became a Christian. And, uh, and I'll, just, I'll just read it, read his story. Um, observing the transformation in his wife following her conversion to Christianity, he began exploring the evidence supporting the truthfulness of the Christian life. Excuse me, I've got to turn the page. What he discovered eventually led to his own commitment to Christ in 1981. So he had this crisis of, of faith because his wife had become a Christian, and now he wanted to know. And, and really, as an investigative reporter, what he was hoping as an atheist is, is, was to prove it all wrong. But here's what happened. And this is what he wrote in his book, The Case for a Creator. And he also wrote some other books, Case for Faith, uh, Case for Jesus. Um, and he says this, to be honest, I didn't want to believe that Christianity could radically transform someone's character and values. It was much easier to raise doubts and manufacture outrageous objections than to consider... <laughs> Can you have some light? Thank you. <laughs> I can't. Uh, there, thank you. We're old, dude. We yeah, are yeah, old. Yeah. Officially, we have arrived at oldness. <laughs> there, there's no doubt I could finish reading that. Yeah. <laughs> It was much easier to raise doubts and manufacture outrageous objections than to consider the possibility that God actually could trigger, trigger a revolutionary turnaround in such a depraved and degenerate life as mine. See, right, right there, he, he, he knew the first truth about us, that we're damaged. If I had stopped asking questions, that's where I would have remained. And I, this last statement, if I hadn't asked questions, I'd have been stuck. And, and one of the things, you know, this, this is Jesus talking to Thomas. Jesus says, Thomas, reach out, reach out. This, this man with, you know, so desperate about healing for his son, he reached out to Jesus. Lee Strobel reached out to Jesus. He had to find out, mm -hmm. and he found out that Jesus was there. Yeah. So, Timmy, let me uh, rattle off a few questions, all right? Okay. Okay. So, do you have any doubts about retirement? No, not at all. <laughs> not at all. Like I said, it's a promotion. I get to be a volunteer now. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Yeah, I, I, get, I get to be a volunteer now. What would you say to people who um, have some doubts about following Jesus? What would you say to them? I would just reiterate uh, what I just shared. Jesus is, has an invitation. He's a wide open invitation to you to ask, to seek, to knock. Don't give up. God has an answer for you, um, when, you when you seek with all your heart, and you will, you will get the answer that you need. It might not be the answer you want, but it will be the answer you need, and it, it will satisfy your soul, what, what, what's really down deep inside of here that you need. Amen. Yeah. All right, one more. Okay. How would you encourage us as a church as we move forward? Oh, this is... Uh, this, this comes from some wisdom uh, way back in the day. This is about 1994. And um, Ken Berkey uh, was the youth pastor back then. And, and the, youth, the youth were doing great. They were filling this place. But the rest of the church had just gone downhill. It was like Bakersfield back then. It was just, <laughs> it was desperate. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, it was, it was desperate. And... Uh, um, but uh, things began to turn around a little bit because uh, Ken was asked to be the interim pastor and I was kind of back online a little bit here and I was helping him out. We were out in the lobby and uh, one of the ladies in our church, Martine Gordon, a wonderful lady, um, she just, <laughs> she looked at Ken and me and she goes, now boys, um, you keep the main thing the main thing. You keep your eyes on Jesus. And that, is, that has been us ever since, right. you know, and that's, that's the heart of, uh, of Green Valley. Keep the main thing the main thing. We're going to keep our eyes on Jesus and do what he asks us to do. That's right. And, you know, if you go outside in, our, in the corner of the lobby over there, you'll see at the top of our core values, it's encounter Jesus. Because without this, this is just a charitable club. Yeah. And so without Jesus, that, that, that's the key to everything here. And I think we should put another sign out there. Doubters welcome. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, doubters welcome. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Hey, um, would you guys just bow your heads with me for just a moment? I'm going to have Tim pray for us in just a minute, but here's the question to ask. Um, maybe you are someone who hasn't crossed the line of faith and you haven't made Jesus the leader of your life. 
or maybe you're somebody who um, has a, a spiritual issue that you've had doubts with God and you just need somebody to pray with you. I think this is appropriate for us to take time out to do that. If that's you today, would you just raise your hand as an acknowledgement? I need some prayer. Amen. Amen. All right. Amen. All right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I see in the back. The yes. Amen. All right. Father, uh, we just come to you right now. And um, God, you see the courage it has taken for these hands to go up to admit that there's doubts, and that there's, there's something desperate going on. There is an answer that is needed. God, we just, we just thank you that you honor that kind of courage. We thank you that you honor the honesty behind that courage. And God, I just pray in the name of Jesus Christ that they would sense your presence right now yeah. and that an answer is coming that will satisfy every need of their soul and spirit. And Father God, I just, I just pray that from this day on, as, as we all continue to follow you, that as doubts come up, that we, we would bring them to you and honestly share them with each other so that we can help each other. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.